Well, welcome all to the award ceremony ESA Group Prize 2022. Very happy to have you here. Also a special welcome to the family of Isa Groot who's here in front of us, but also joining us through live stream who uh, join us and listening to the project of last year and the winner of this year. Uh, my name is Karen Kral. I'm an advisor science communication at the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And together with the Amsterdam University Fund, we issue the ISA Groot Prize uh, now on a yearly basis. This is the second year. About the prize and the background of the prize and ISA Groot, the Amsterdam University Fund will tell us a little bit more uh, later. But today we are here especially to, of course, hear the winner of this year. But before we do that, we first will hear from uh, the winner of last year which is Francesca Ranalli, who is here, and also Jade uh, Mandrake. She's also with us. You can already see, us, see her there. <laughs> she's joining uh, through uh, Zoom because she's in uh, New York. Yeah, and Francesca won the prize uh, last year for a project in which they make uh, neighborhood places together with young people, teenagers, architects, and artists. And, well, we're very curious about uh, how that uh, developed. So without much uh, further ado, I would like to give the word to Francesca, who will tell us more about her project. Um, so, first of all, thank you again for the prize and for the opportunity you gave us to conduct this project the last year. It's very nice to be here and see, actually, the, the, new, the new winner, uh, how you are happy and celebrating with a big smile. I still have the picture of when I got the prize last year with a big smile. Um, so, let's see if this works. Okay, this is ours. Um, so, we called our project uh, Hacking Urban Boundaries Hub, and we also developed uh, a website. Maybe I can try to show you a bit the website, if the technology will allow this. Maybe no? Maybe yes? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Through the website, I encourage you to go and visit and uh, see what we actually did and put that together with young people, what, they did in, what we did uh, during uh, last year. Well, here we, we try to tell the story that I'm going to tell you uh, now today uh, of uh, the, the part of the project uh, that, we got, that we conducted in the Bronx, uh, New York, and uh, um, in uh, Almere Port in the Netherlands. And we use this platform also to reach the young people that were not actually directly involved in the project, but they were living in the neighborhood. Because the, one of the main ideas of the project was to have a locally rooted group, but also globally connected. And that's also why... But the idea is that I would like you to not only hear my, my words, but also see the images, actually, of the, the young people that participated, because that's what gave me also a lot of uh, inspiration as well. Okay. Okay, so... The ideas behind our project were that actually uh, we believe that uh, young people are a key component of neighborhood life, of the community in their neighborhood, but they are, let's say, often they don't have apparent right on the use of public spaces and on the co-production of those spaces. That was the reason that uh, led us towards writing this proposal for the, the Isaac Root Prize and start this this project. We worked mainly with the teenagers, so from 13 to 17 years old, and uh, in two groups. So as I said, one in Almere and one in New York. Um, with, uh, uh, a different, uh, with different outcomes, because uh, the project aimed to be bottom-up. What does it mean? It means that we let the young people decide what they actually wanted to do, how they wanted to develop this hub, these laboratories together with us. 
But the main idea was also that they would uh, uh, use different type of uh, creative methods uh, to express their voices. Um, and uh, this project uh, was conducted in the previous semester by me and uh, Jade, um, but uh, it will not finish here, it will continue uh, also next semester in uh, Taipei, Taiwan, and in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, while um, in Almeria, New York, Jade, Jade and I conducted it directly, hands-on, with the young people, uh, now we will use the lesson learned from this project uh, to help uh, local researchers in these two new uh, contexts uh, to, to continue this work and to learn also how we can actually develop this toolkit of methods for, for, for young people involvement. I hope this will work. Yes. Um, well, um, this was uh, the location where I conducted the, the project in, uh, in Almere Port. Uh, the group that participated was a small group of around five uh, uh, young people, but they also helped to disseminate uh, the work uh, uh, up to 60 people who actually voted and participated in the decision-making process. Um, the, the group showed uh, a very strong uh, uh, knowledge on socially and ecologically sustainable design uh, and together with them uh, we designed a space of encounter for them in their own neighborhood. Uh, they chose where to design it, they chose the design. Uh, we actually developed a 3D model together. There were some of these uh, young people who were really into gaming, 3D, modeling, so they were really enthusiastic about doing, uh, doing this. And uh, uh, we also uh, literally uh, planted the seeds of uh, these ideas uh, by planting some plants in the spot where they actually envisioned to realize this space of encounter for them. Uh, they, they were very inspiring um, and I was very happy to work with them and learn how they, they actually had great ideas on uh, uh, how to develop this project. Uh, we uh, included also some uh, uh, guest lecturers, for instance, uh, uh, we uh, experimented with a game, a, a board game with them and with a researcher from the AFH, um, where we learn actually the mechanism behind uh, uh, governance and urban planning. Uh, or we also invited, uh, for instance, a, 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 a municipal officer to explain what they were actually the proje projects for the place where they wanted to realize, if it was feasible, and how we could actually push forward our ideas to hopefully realize it <laughs> in the next steps. Jade, are you there? Yes, I am here. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Maybe we can also see you. No. Let's see. Um, yes, if I can be seen. Let's see. Uh, can, can you see me? Yeah. Uh, maybe for the Q&A afterwards? Yeah, or with the Q&A uh, later on. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and share with you my contribution if you're ready yeah. for the, the group in New York. So yes, I can't see anybody at the moment, but I'm very happy that you're all here. And uh, it's wonderful to be here and share with you this project. And we're, we're very grateful that it was made possible with the support of the Isaac Root Prize. So the other group, as Francesca mentioned, was, was in the Bronx with me. And here I'm beginning with a picture of my group of teens standing in front of the artist residency where I worked with them and whose courtyard they designed their plan in. And just to give you uh, some background of this context, the South Bronx, one of the five boroughs in New York City, is an area that's faced with a number of obstacles, uh, from the highest rate of ch children in foster care to the highest levels of respiratory illness due in large part to nearby industrial pollution. 
um, to the highest teen pregnancy rate citywide. So these teens are really faced with a lot. And uh, we were so happy to be able to work with them and give them some agency, some connectivity and personal expression in their neighborhoods. Uh, if you can switch the slide, please, Francesca. Thanks. So with my group, the co-creative potential of mixing rational and strategic planning together with non-rational creative methods took on a distinct form using intuitive art making as a mode of knowledge production. Here you can see some of the teens gardening in the green space we provided for them. That was the courtyard space. And you can also see a few examples of the intuitive art making the teens engaged in. And the next slide, please. So the co-design process here it consisted of visitors, such as longtime residents of the Bronx, sharing their talents and stories with the teens, uh, but also international researchers who came as guests to help the teens think through some challenges, and specifically the challenges that arose for them during the process of transferring inspiration from their intuitive art to a design for the space, which mainly center on care for the space they designed, protection and safety. So these are, were all issues that were very important to them. Um, and here, this video, you can see them looking at their designs now with curiosity because during the intuitive process, I really encouraged them to just play and not try to strategize or think about how or if anything can be translated, but just to you know, experience the, the sort of gut-led um, art making process. So solutions that the uh, researchers were able to explore with them was, for instance, working in mutually supportive ways with the natural ecosystem for care, care being one of their main concerns um, in that area, and also solar pal panels for lighting. They were wondering where their light sources were going to come from and how they, you know, they would be funded, and also working with the concept of beauty to safeguard from vandalism, which was a major concern for them also. Um, and if you can change the slide, please. Um, just one by, yes, perfect. So the project concluded with a design plan, as you can see, um, and that incorporates many of their intuitive motifs with those issues that arose for them during our talks and discussions. And this was key I want to underline that the intuitive art making helped the teens identify further needs and desires that they were unable to articulate in their initial talks. Uh, this proved especially valuable where they felt uninspired about the possibility for change in their neighborhood, which was um, you know, very relevant for them. And the final event that we had, it included also a panel discussion with youth and parents, local residents, and a variety of stakeholders in the South Bronx. These included the Department of Education, Sobro, the nonprofit who partnered with us in a local school, um, helping to connect us with the teens, and the New York Botanical Garden that came to support the teens in the gardening process. So the combined non-rational and rational methods resulted in a number of unexpected and exciting opportunities for the neighborhood and further intergenerational activities. This included so-called classrooms out of the classroom, so to learn about social history from locals, um, multi-species ecosystems in their neighborhoods from local gardens. We had a trip to a local garden to help them to think about the green space that they were gardening in. And also opportunities for co-designing with mixed use uh, real estate development planners, which is a, a very hot and contested um, issue in terms of gentrification in that area. So thinking about actually working together so that the teens can have a, a stake and a voice in some of this real estate development. So these discussions are currently ongoing to explore how we can use this knowledge in planning efforts and actually implement um, some of these ideas. And I'll stop here and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. I conclude with what we actually uh, did also after we finished the, basically the, the lab with the young people. Uh, we had also the chance to develop an intergenerational residency uh, where we actually encouraged the young people from our group 
to uh, take part of uh, an intergenerational group from their neighborhood. Uh, and we experimented with ways of uh, opening up public spaces for them through walking and uh, um, experiencing actually uh, using senses and experiencing the space around uh, them. In the in the end of this, of this project, we also, as Jade said, in both contexts, we developed uh, uh, panel discussions with uh, young people, but also with uh, uh, social workers, uh, policy makers, uh, uh, other uh, age group residents, and other local organizations um, to, uh, to brainstorm together on how we can actually uh, further develop and realize this project and what was actually the need uh, and what we could do uh, more uh, in the next uh, phases. Um, I can finish now and um, well, by working with young people, we got very much used to uh, having more collaborative, collective discussion, not just being here presenting. Uh, so whenever, if you feel like sharing some comments, asking questions, or just uh, explaining your feeling while watching the images, please. I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, what is um, the step you have made in this project that you can say, this is my conclu conclusion and this is what I have learned from it and what can help you uh, in the second step? Yeah, I, I have this, so I think just shortly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's say two um, two two level. Uh, one is from the theoretical contribution. We are writing uh, an article and uh, develop the analysis that we did uh, with these young people. On a practical level, we basically develop the toolkit. So the methods and the way on how we can actually replicate uh, this type of project in other contexts. Basically, the toolkit will uh, include the, um, how to engage with the different type of organizations and the methods, so the co-creative methods that we actually developed with young people. Those are the lessons learned. These are the, the things that we will learn on what actually works and what actually <laughs> maybe are the challenges of uh, working with the, this specific age group. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Is that okay? And what is, because I didn't understand everything quite well, but what is the difference? What did you see as a conclusion between the difference between New York, the Bronx, and the Almere Port? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, there are two very much different contexts. Uh, this helped us a lot because we could actually compare different dynamics with the. Uh, um, uh, with the at the neighborhood level, there are two different neighborhoods. One is a gentrifying neighborhood with a lot of uh, history and uh, challenges in the past, while the other one is a really new neighborhood. But in both contexts, actually, the youth we engaged didn't have uh, a voice, didn't feel represented, didn't feel part of the neighborhood. And that was what we helped them doing it. And that's why I say bottom up, because we didn't want to come there and say, okay, you need to do this. We wanted to learn from them what were actually the needs and the challenges that they encounter in their daily life. Uh, and from the, from the context, from the different contexts, we learned how to actually engage with different stakeholders. Because in different, uh, in, in, there are very different realities. Uh, like, I give you a very simple and maybe stupid example. Uh, in the beginning, when we were saying in the Netherlands that we were researchers, um, people were really happy to engage with us. They were trusting us as researchers that we would do something uh, uh, for them, with them. While in the New York context, there was a completely different uh, reaction on this. There was a, a kind of initial distrust. So we had to explain much more 
what we actually wanted to do and that we were not just studying them but we wanted to co-create with them something. I, I hope this is a very simple example uh, can, uh, can help. Take one more question. Yeah, sure. I'm very interested. How did you select or did you come up with these young people in Almira? Because uh, South Bronx, in fact, does mean more to me. There's a lot of problems than Almira. And so, how did you come up with this group of young people? Yeah, I think that that's an important part of the toolkit itself, how to recruit them, actually. Um, well, we also adopted different methods. So in Almere, uh, we started from the local social workers, the young Jara workers. Um, and uh, through them, uh, we tried also to decide in which places we would meet that they would feel comfortable to join us. Uh, and we started actually the recruitment before we applied even for the um, ISA Crut Prize. Um, so mainly from the social workers, but uh, in some cases also from the local schools. So the, the high schools that are present in the neighborhoods, there are three main uh, schools. So through the teachers, we were able to, to recruit some of the participants. And actually in my group, we hired also um, a peer-to-peer -peer coordinator. That was an initial thought that we wanted to do in both contexts, but in Almera this worked, uh, while in New York it didn't work. Uh, also because they have they had different age group. In uh, Almere were 16, 17. Uh, so I think it was nice for them to have a peer-to-peer -peer coordinator who would translate my language into a, their language. Uh, and while in New York, there was a, the group was younger, was uh, 13 years old. So it was also different. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you for sharing with us the, the project and results. And looking forward to hear more about the new places you are going to implement it. I think then we now move on to the following thing in the program. So now I go to my slide that I made for that. Uh, so now I give the word to almost uh, telling us who the won the prize. Well, we already won, uh, know who won the prize. But Marike Freilink, she's a controller, I believe is the English word. Yeah. Chartered Accountant of the Amsterdam University Fund. And before we issue the award, she will first tell us something about the prize itself and also about Isaac Ruth himself. Thank you. And I hope this microphone works. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, special welcome also to the people who are here attending us online. Uh, my name is Marieke Vrijlink, and I'm uh, very honored to be here today uh, to present the Isaac Root Prize uh, in my capacity as a treasurer of the Amsterdam University Fund. And I became treasurer because I'm a chartered accountant and I graduated from the Amsterdam University, just like Isaac Root. And what I would like to do uh, today is to tell you a little bit more of this special, remarkable man. And I'm also very honored uh, to honor this um, chartered accountant. And most of you might, may think of chartered accountants as dull people, uh, but Isaac Root proves the difference because he was also an inventor. He had three different patents registered to his name and he was working on many more. Um, but he, um, for me, especially appealing is that he was uh, um, already in the 1920s working on the mechanization of bookkeeping. So way before we had computers, he already had a patent on this. And the patent was let, later on um, taken over by IBM. Uh, so he was working on something really big. When he was in his 30s in 1927, he made up his will. And it's also quite special that somebody at this age is already making his will. And he had it recorded that one fifth of his uh, estate was to be used for the competition we are here for today, to promote world peace and efficient distribution, projects contributing to that. And 
that we are here today and able to award this prize if thanks to his vision uh, to record this will in his will because he didn't manage to uh, finish all his projects because he was murdered in Auschwitz on 11th of February 1944. His will came into effect after the war and the, an amount of 10,000 guilders was transferred to, the, Dutch, uh, to uh, the city of Amsterdam to use it for the price for the what's now called the University of Amsterdam, but then was called the Municipal University. Somehow, the will didn't get executed then, and the money was only later transferred to the Amsterdam University Fund, but it was, had grown by then. So that's why we are now have a solid price of 5,000 euros, and we can award it every year. The first time the prize was eventually awarded was in 1989 in the Peace Palace in The Hague. Today, together with the Faculty of Social Behavioral Science and the Root family, we, uh, we can still strive to award this prize. And uh, this year we had six projects who were eligible for the prize. And um, uh, their proposals were accepted. And the jury for this year consisted of four members and as I was saying, the family is still very much involved, which also shows uh, that Isaac was, is to be remembered. Uh, David Root, who is present here online, uh, his father is a, constant, is a distant cousin of Isaac Root. Paula Koningsveld, whose grandmother was related to Isaac Root. Uh, Anjeta Visser um, is the dean of the, uh, of the faculty. And Ada Vermeer Janssen, my predecessor as treasurer of the University Fund, but also a chartered accountant, um, is part of the jury. Uh, I would like to give the word to Anjeta, who will explain how the jury reached their decision. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is indeed Agnete Fischer, um, one of the members of the jury, and I'm, I'm very happy um, to first of all say how happy we, we are as a faculty to be able to, uh, to award this prize, issue this prize, uh, because it used to be in another faculty, and uh, I think it fits very, very well because we are really aiming for more societal impact. We are aiming for more sustainable research, research on sustainability. And this combination of um, uh, doing something for society and also studying, investigating these types of challenging, challenges, that is uh, at the heart of our faculty right now. Um, so, therefore, we are very happy to have this prize. Um, so, the, the, the question is actually how we decided. So, we had a couple of uh, very good proposals that fitted the aims of the Isaac Root Prize, and we rated them on a number of criteria, uh, of which, I mean, there, there are a couple of criteria that are also in, in, in the uh, publication on the, on the prize, but uh, w uh, what standed out in uh, Anna's proposal was actually the fact that it's an excellent uh, combination of different things. So it's a combination of practice and theory. It is a combination of societal impact and research. It is a combination of different uh, societal challenges. So it's not only about sustainability, but it's also about uh, social, um, social integration or sustainability of uh, minorities, you could say something like that. So, so, um, so this combination of these different things made your project really unique. And, uh, and so I am very happy to give you to the floor to say something more about this. Thank you. Here, 
Lisa. Huh? <laughs> Before the floor is yours, you yeah. have to accept the reward. So uh -huh. <laughs> I'm very happy to hand over to you. Thank you very much. 5,000 euros to spend it well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, so I'm just going to use this microphone, it works. Well, um, thank you very much, um, Agneta and everyone, uh, the Amsterdam University Fund and everyone who's here, um, especially, of course, the uh, family of Isaac Root. I'm very grateful and we are very grateful, um, together with my supervisor, Gehemmen Brick, Dr. Frank van, uh, Frank van Harefeld, and also Maria, who is here from the uh, Makers Unite, so actually people we're going to work with. So thank you so much for this opportunity to, yeah, what you just said, bring um, research, combine research and practice and trying to, um, oh, this is, Sorry. This yeah, is it's now on my side, yeah, yeah. and uh, trying to, um, yeah, create, uh, co-create knowledge that is meaningful for uh, transitions that we really much need in order to reach the sustainability goals and the social goals that we have set. So um, I'm just trying to, yeah, start my presentation. Um, actually, before starting, I wanted to ask you, when was the last time that you repaired a piece of clothing? Um, is that something that happens a lot uh, nowadays, or is it something you have not really done? Because personally, I cannot really remember the last time that I, uh, that I remembered something. But um, anyone who's doing that on a regular basis? The day before yesterday. Oh. <laughs> Nice. So I see my friends in the middle. Nobody raised their, forehead, their hands. But um, well, that's. The, I'm not saying. Wanting to frame that in that. Well, it's not very surprising that not everyone is preparing um, repairing their clothing anymore because the clothing industry has developed in the past 20 years, especially uh, to an industry that is very fast. So that means that the clothing is not of very high quality, so it's not really worth it to repair it anymore. But also that there's so many new trends and styles developing all the time, even now on a daily or weekly basis, so that uh, it, people don't even want to repair it anymore because they want something new. So uh, like I kind of like this illustration of uh, yeah, kind of a mountain of clothing that is accumulating now. And uh, to give you some numbers, in the Netherlands, the average person is buying uh, 45 new clothing pieces per year, but also throwing away around the same amount of time. So of course this is an average and there's like differences, there's people that consume a lot and people that don't. But yeah, just to give you an average number, but also showing that almost the same amount of time, uh, clothes that is bought is also thrown away, which could be repaired <laughs> or could be uh, recycled or used, it doesn't have to uh, be thrown away. And actually from the clothing that is thrown away, only 7% in the Netherlands end up being recycled or reused. So most of them end up in uh, different countries in the global south on um, being en ending up on waste piles or being burned and yeah, causing further environmental damage. And you probably know that uh, yeah, there's a lot of environmental impacts of the clothing industry. like. Uh, water, um, the, it needs to have, uh, clothing needs a lot of water to be made, for example, like one cotton shirt needs 3,000 liters of water. That is uh, three years of uh, drinking water for one person. Um, there's a lot of CO2 emissions uh, emitted during the process from, from making a clothing, transporting it uh, to, to the consu end consumers. And um, there's a lot of uh, toxic chemicals released during the dyeing process, like I'm not going to go more into detail, but there's a range of environmental impacts that are not um, in line with what we need f for, for to stay, sustain the planet for future life. Oh. And um, this, there needs to be a shift from this current linear system, from where clothing is made, uh, to, uh, clothing is produced from resources, then made into something that doesn't last, and then actually wasted and thrown away. And that's not very efficient. What, what about we would just like keep using the materials for longer, so having more of a circular system where there's actually no waste, or as little waste as possible. And that is a transition that is needed that needs a lot of different people coming together and the different uh, disciplines coming together. So that's, for example, uh, laws have to be um, passed for, for 
brands to be more accountable of what they make, to limit maybe um, advertising towards especially young people. Um, there needs to be technology to create materials in a more sustainable way to recycle what we already have um, to, um, to track where clothing comes from and to count the environmental impacts to see if what we, if the changes actually make a difference. But what we think is that yeah, the social sciences and social psychology actually also are very relevant for this transition. And uh, that is because if you boil it down, it really comes to being people and actions that need to be uh, conducted in different roles of people. So it's not only the consumption, but it's of course like in people in their jobs need to behave differently. People um, as, as citizens need to vote and for representatives that are making decisions. People in representative roles need to make different decisions. And these decisions are, uh, in, as psychosocial psychologists, we can study why people make the, uh, certain decisions and behave and uh, understand the underlying emotions and attitudes and thereby hopefully making sure that this transition and these laws and technologies are um, implemented in a faster rate and the rate that we need it to be implemented. Um, and at the social psychology um, group in Amsterdam, we're actually studying quite a lot of clothing rela related um, behaviors. So together with uh, Cameron Brick and Frank van Haarfeld, for example, one, uh, one project currently going on um, to better understand uh, why, what drives luxury consumption and status, and if there's maybe some sort of um, ox uh, some sort of mismatch with, with sustainability, does lu can luxury and sustainability be combined, or is that uh, how do people have some sort of conflicting attitudes towards that? Then uh, recently funded uh, a project, very big one, that the, by the NWO on reactions to recycled clothing, and that's actually quite a big innovation that right now a lot of clothing is, is made up of different materials, so for example cotton and polyester, and now they can't really be recycled. But this, uh, there's a new con technology developed by people from the UVA, from the chemistry department that can recycle these blends. And um, we can, we want to study of how people think about recycled clothing and also if they're willing to actually hand in their clothes for it to be recycled. Then um, we're also looking at uh, have a recent project on microfibers through washing. So there's a lot of microfibers emitted uh, while people are washing polyester clothes. And uh, there's actually a way by using a bag that you can collect these microfibers and make them visible. And that could be an, a way to make people more aware of the actual effects and, uh, on the environment of their consumption. And generally, uh, what I'm looking into in my PhD is reduced consumption, so buying less and how positive emotions uh, could play a role in there. So can it be rewarding to consume less in a more sustainable way, as opposed to the framing that is often used that we need to do it because otherwise we all uh, gonna die. And, uh, <laughs> and so that's uh, maybe a more sustainable uh, way of looking at it. And yeah, I was actually really happy to meet Itz and Maria who are in the back there. Um, in Amsterdam, a local initiative, uh, Make Us Unite, and the United to Repair Center, who are um, a yeah, creative in agency, I would say, bringing together people from, with uh, refugee backgrounds who are new to the Netherlands and may struggle uh, on the Dutch labor market, and bringing them together by uh, creating uh, yeah, jobs, but also creating a place to connect and to meet people, connect with different brands, to, to connect with locals. And through the, the mode through it, they do it is uh, through offering clothing repair to companies so that companies uh, can make clothing repair part of their business model. So, for example, Patagonia and Scotch and Soda, two companies uh, that have also based in the Netherlands partly, they now can, if there's a consumer that something is breaking, they can send it to the United Repair Center, it's repaired there, and then the consumer can get it back. And that's for free and that's part of the business model. And of course, this is re uh, for uh, clothing companies to, to, to gain more responsibility of the things they produce, but also to hopefully um, stimulate more durable and more repairable clothing on the long term. And the goal is, yeah, 300,000 repairs per year and a million kilograms of textiles saved over the next five years within the Netherlands. 
So that's of course a really nice goal to work towards, a really local goal. And um, what when we talk, start talking to each other, we notice that there's also some psychology we could, uh, could and some behavior change we could integrate. And that was because they have, uh, they also want to offer clothing repair workshops to uh, consumers, uh, but also to um, to people working at the brands that they collaborate with in the offices in Amsterdam, to just make people more aware of how uh, what, what how to, to to teach them skill of how to uh, repair clothing, but of course also to make them aware of the consequences of the clothing industry, and. Um, what we then, we thought this further through and uh, came to the conclusion that it might be because young people are one segment that consumes a lot of clothes. And, and, we, and we thought, okay, maybe we can find a way to um, engage peop young people, especially with the circularity transition through these workshops and try to really adjust them to the needs of the young people and make them effective for them. But not only that it's a one-time thing that you go once to a workshop, but that you actually like take something from it and uh, that's of course uh, part of social psychology so we we thought uh, how can we uh, how can we design them in an engaging way an empowering way and came to for now four parts that we really want to try to uh, emphasize it's first of all the sense of urgency so awareness of why we need to change the way we're consuming but then also, of course, practical skills, and that is sewing and upcycling, making something that is maybe old, making it, making it new, but also building a community. So going there together with your friends, participating in a group, meeting new people. Then through that, this workshop doesn't just stay one thing, but stays something you can talk about for a longer time. And um, last but not least, also positive emotions. So how can you motivate the people by by not only telling them what to do and because they have to do it, but because they want to do it of themselves because it's in rewarding in itself. So for, for example, emotions like connectedness and pride. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to see how the next step would be to test how the workshops are currently doing, how people, the participants think about it, and then see how we can make them uh, more effective and more engaging and test which is uh, test, of course, the effectiveness of, of the workshops. And that's, I think, something that we really find important uh, in our group as well, is like test real behavior. So um, do people actually consume less after, but buy less after engaging in the workshops? Do they repair uh, clothing afterwards? And uh, do they ever like interact with Make Us Unite on more events? Do they come back? Like how, how does this behavior unfold over time? So yeah, that's, that's the plan and um, I'm really happy to also talk to you about what, what you think and what, uh, to have feedback or any ideas on it. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> I would suggest mm -hmm. that the, the, the conversation we take then to join for a drink. Oh, also from me, congratulations. Thank and I already invite you next year to share with us uh, well, how it all went with the workshops and maybe hear from them in between and motivate yeah. us at the university too to take part in mm. these. Thank you. And if you would like to join for a drink in the back there, uh, they will pour us something that uh, I'm not sure what there is, but I think there's like sodas, wine, beer, non-alcoholic, alcoholic. <laughs> and thank you for being here and hopefully you will see each other uh, next year for the 2023 edition. Thank you. Also to the family. Thank you.